Welcome to Stewardology, a podcast where two worlds collide. In this show, financial advisor Tim Russell and Reverend Drew Geisey come together to explore the intersection of financial stewardship and theology. Their unique perspectives help Christians and churches understand and apply a biblical framework for everyday financial decisions, so Christians everywhere can improve and strengthen their walk with Christ through biblical stewardship. Before we get started, we just wanted you to know that the topics discussed in this podcast are for general information only and are not intended to provide specific investment advice or recommendations. Investing and investment strategies involve risk, including the potential loss of principal. Past performance is not a guarantee of future results. Securities and advisory services are offered through Genius Wealth Management, member FINRA and CIPIC. Without further ado, here are your hosts, Tim Russell and Drew Geisey. I'm Tim Russell. And I'm Pastor Drew Geisey. And we welcome you to episode 106 of the Stewardology Podcast. Podcast. I kind of yeah. threw you off you on that totally one, You totally threw me off on that one. But That's hey, okay. we'll, we'll let you start off then. Yeah, you know. <laughs> so today, we're going to be talking about a topic that is very timely. Many, 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 many people are thinking about and wondering about the topic that we're going to address. Now, I, I want to give you a quick disclaimer. T- t- typically, when we do these podcasts, our goal is to make them timeless. So yes. if you're listening to us right immediately when we release the episode or you listen to us a year or a decade in the future, it's still our goal is that the content is still going to be relevant. Yes. So we may talk about a market downturn, but we're going to talk about it in a way that that helps us understand how to think about maybe even future market downturns. Mm-hmm. So today we're going to be talking about something that people are asking about. First of all, we have had listeners reach out to us and say, I want to know about this topic. Yeah. At church on Sunday, two different people in the space of maybe 10 minutes came up to me and asked me about this particular topic. Mm. People want to know, what do we think about with regard to Joe Biden's student loan forgiveness program, is it biblical? Should I take it? I feel, I feel some conflict in my soul yeah. about whether or not I should take this forgiveness. Please help me out. That's going to be what we're talking about today. We're going to try to keep it timeless and timely. So stick with us today. We're going to be addressing as many of those questions related to this topic as we can. So just just the other week, as we all know, as Tim shared, the Biden administration announced that with a stroke of a pen made by the president, up to $20,000 of student loan debt per person would be canceled or forgiven. And what a nice gesture, at least for some people, but for others, this gesture may feel like a slap in the face. How should we think about this kind of issue? (laughs) They may think of it as slap in the face for two different reasons, right? On the one hand, I mean, shouldn't I pay back my debts? On the other hand, $10,000, $20,000 is not enough. Well said, well said. And then you have other people and they're thinking, well, as we'll talk about later on, it's like, well, why should I assume another person's debt? And so there's all these questions that are out there. In today's episode, we're going to do our best. There are clearly stewardship implications. Yes, we're going to do our best to take the emotions out of this topic and speak to what we know as the truth about this governmental plan and to see what we can see about student loan forgiveness and what the scriptures have to say. Next episode, though, Tim, we're going to dive into the student loan crisis and specifically to examine and see if student loans, are they really worth the cost? Here's the thing. If student loans haven't been a crisis, we wouldn't need forgiveness in the first place. Well said. So we're going to talk about why it's a crisis and how we should think about it if we're thinking about going to college or if we have the debt and we're trying to pay it off, how do we deal with it? So let's jump in. That's next week. Yeah, that's next week. Make sure you subscribe so you don't miss an episode. Absolutely. So let's first take a look at some of the cost speculations. Um, There's an economist that's out there. His name is, let me get this, Brian Westbury. And he has a a Monday morning uh, document that he puts out Mm -hmm. called the Monday Morning Outlook. And it's quite interesting. Yeah, I'm familiar with Westbury. And what he has to say, this is what he wrote just a week or so ago. 
the Biden administration says that the, this, this change the, with the student loan forgiveness would cost about $240 billion in the next 10 years. The Committee for Responsible Federal Budget says it's going to be 440 to 600 billion, and a budget model from Wharton says it's going to be one trillion dollars. So there, there's numbers all over the map here, Tim. Yeah, I think there are a lot of assumptions built into this. Sure, we we could be talking about just the pure principle. Right, that could be one thing, and the pure principle is probably around the the two point or the two hundred forty billion dollars. I if would you're agree. Counting uh, interest payments and yeah. all of the other ancillary costs and fees associated with it, we could be looking at a larger number. And if if they're thinking this is just the beginning of a bigger trend to forgive all student loans, we yeah. could be looking easily into the trillions of dollars. And I did read into that or read that this yeah. past week that. These numbers are all over the place. And no matter where the number is, it's going to impact our economy in one way, shape, or form. You can't just wipe out that and not have it have some form of impact in you one way, shape, or form. you got to pay the piper sometime. So with that in mind, let's take a look, Tim, at the program overview. This, What are they saying? What are some of the things yeah. that they're saying what are the that's features, part right? of it? Yes. So I guess the, the biggest deal here is that current student loans – that are at least issued uh, or or advanced before June thirtieth of this year. So the the loan had to have been advanced prior to June thirtieth of this year. You are eligible for up to ten thousand dollars per person for student loan forgiveness, provided your income is under one hundred and twenty five thousand if you're single, or two hundred fifty thousand if you're married filing jointly okay or twenty thousand dollars so it's ten thousand dollar forgiveness for anyone who meets that income criteria or twenty thousand dollar student loan forgiveness if you also in addition to those things got a pell grant explain what that is real quick so a pell grant is a uh is a forgivable it's essentially like a forgivable loan that you would get if you are from a low income family. Okay. So if, if you were raised in a family with a very modest income, very modest means, went to college, got the Pell Grant, um, you would have applied for it through FAFSA. They would notify you that you were eligible for it. It would have been forgiven. So it, it's not something you're carrying today, but you would be eligible for an additional $10,000 of student loan forgiveness. The problem is at this point, the, the forgiveness, um, it's not necessarily automatic. So if if you are an individual, if you are a student loan borrower who is on an income-based repayment plan, that, mm-hmm. that means you've gone to the government, you've gone through studentaid.com, gov and filled out the information and applied for the the income based repayment plan you had to demonstrate your income is right. low enough to only pay a certain percentage of your disposable income and it was 10% up until this mm-hmm. and now they're planning on changing it dropping it to 5% i interesting. read interesting interesting so all of that right if 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 you have an income based repayment plan Every year, you're giving your income data to the government. Right. So they have it. And if they have it, they will automatically know whether or not you qualify for the forgiveness. Therefore, for you, it would be automatic. However, if you are not on an income-based repayment plan, Mm -hmm. you would need to submit documentation. You would need to file a form with the government to give them your data to prove that you're eligible and then – They would theoretically, assuming everything works the way it's supposed to work and it's the government, don't count on it, uh, they would forgive that loan. Typically, I think they're talking about by the end of the year. Okay. I didn't know what the time frame was. So I do know that they're still having the pause of repayment till the end of the year. So I I think it would be helpful to timestamp this conversation because by the time it's released, and it's probably going to be released two to three weeks out from here, uh, data may have changed and new information might even be available. Uh, But this is um, middle of September that we're recording this episode. By October, uh, they're talking about having forms available and ready to be released. I would be surprised if it's available that quickly. It's probably closer to the end of October or even into November before those forms are available for individual borrowers to go in and file for their debt forgiveness. Now, 
here's another little caveat. If you have been a good steward, Mm. you have been given a great reprieve during COVID the last two years, you have been making extra payments to get your student loan down because everything's frozen. No payments are required. Interest rates are kind of frozen for now. Right. So you're trying to pay down aggressively to be a good student, your student loans. And guess what? You did a good job. You paid off all your student loans. Good job. And now Joe Biden comes back and he forgives $10,000 yeah. of student loans that you just spent all that money to do. Mm-hmm. Well, there is a way to file for a refund Correct. of your payments. And you can re- get a refund of some of your payments over a certain period of time. I don't know all of the details there, but you would you basically talk to your loan servicer and request that refund. They would do that, and then you would then be eligible for the forgiveness. So you would get the money back that you paid. Right. Which is nice. It's good. And one of the things I did read about the student loan forgiveness is when it comes to a federal level, there's going to be no taxable Correct. aspect of it. Correct. But some I am, states. I am hearing some states yep. are getting their grubby little paws in there and they're looking at how they can actually glean some income on this. So, again, let's put it in, in context. Uh, the, the IRS says that if you have a loan, um, let's just say you have a credit card or a personal loan and and you pay a balance that's less than full you do what's called settle for for uh actually i forget the technical term but you're basically settling the the debt you're you okay. owe 20 you pay 5 and and you know they settle it up and they take care of it, it it's going to ding your your credit it's going to cause a problem but essentially what's happening there is they're forgiving $15,000 of debt correct that you technically owe. You know what they you know what they do? They send you a 1099 at the end of the year. They say that that's income. And that is deemed as income. Yeah. I have had a number of individuals who have been under crippling debt, not been able to handle it. They try, they were able to make some arrangements, they pay their debts off at least um, as much as they're able to. They make settlement with these companies and then they get the tax bill for it and they're shocked. Yeah. Normally, any kind of loan that is forgiven any portion of that payment that is forgiven it is considered taxable income that is normal Mm -hmm. for the irs and even for some states however in this particular circumstance with federal student loans with this biden forgiveness plan we are not going to be subject to federal income tax on that forgiveness that's that is a nice feature so uh, the person that applies for this, beware, your state could reach in to, you're going to have a difference It's possible. in possibility, yep. a difference in your taxable uh, income for the next year. And I think one other important note is that this government program is only available to those who have governmental student loans. Federal student loans, yes. private student loans right now, they do not apply. And I think that's important to be made known here because a lot of people, they'll take it and they'll privatize their loans afterwards because they may get a better interest rate or something. They're at a loss. That's correct. Yeah. So I think that's important to say. There's a lot of stuff that's online. We just did some high, big picture overview of things. Yeah, you'll still need to do your research to know Absolutely. how it works for you. But this is a good introduction to the topic. But let's talk. Let's take a few moments and talk about: Is the student loan forgiveness is it biblical? Oh man, that's a big question. It, it is, and it's the question that I think Tim, you and I have. It's come our way multiple times, so we wanted to kind of What's dive funny in. What's is that you and I have wrestled with this we as ha- well. We have, and we, we see it maybe a lot the same, but some difference on there. So to state the obvious, there were no student loans back in biblical days. It was, just wasn't there. And because of this, we need to take a look at the Word of God and kind of see what does the Bible say about loans, borrowing, repayment. And clearly the Bible does speak about this. And Timmy, even offline before we started, you were sharing with, with me about you just did a little rabbit hole yeah. study on usury in Scripture. And maybe we'll even bring a little bit of that up. Mm. But I want to bring up this passage of Scripture in Deuteronomy 15, verses 1 through 6. It says, At the end of every seven years, you must cancel debts. This is how it is to be done. 
Every creditor shall cancel the loan that has been made to his fellow Israelite. He shall not require payment from his fellow Israelite or brother because the Lord's time for canceling debt has been prom- has been proclaimed. You may require payment from a foreigner, but you must cancel any debt your brother owes you. However, there should be no poor among you, for in the land of, of the Lord your God is giving you to possess as your inheritance, he will richly bl- bless you. Now, verse 5, I think, is interesting here. Pay attention to this verse. If only you fully obey the Lord your God and are careful to follow all these commands I am giving you today, for the Lord your God will bless you as he has promised, and you will lend to many nations but will borrow from none. You will rule over many nations, but none will rule over you. Mm Mm-hmm. So this is what some have called, as I did some research here, a regular remission or forgiveness of debt, Mm -hmm. as we see here. Every seven years, Mm -hmm. it was for the people, Israelites to other Israelites, cancel debt. And the reasoning for this canceling a debt, why it was granted, is for the reliance on the Lord for his provision, for generosity to those in the same family, in the same nationality, and also to allow God's blessing to flow to those who are being generous in that way, because it is generous. Yeah. I mean, all of those are partly reasons. I I think the biggest reason that, that God is commanding this is because it points to a greater future. Yes. So when when we have debt, we have obligations, there's the year of Jubilee. Every yes. seven years, we have a year of Jubilee where, where land goes back to the original owner. When debt is forgiven, when slaves are set free, mm-hmm. indentured servitude is set free, all of these things are a way for us to say there is coming a day of rest. There is coming a day where where all things will be set right, yeah. where all accounts will be balanced and settled. It points us to Jesus. Mm-hmm. So debt forgiveness in the Old Testament time frame here in the in Deuteronomy, and, and actually I should say sadly, very, very few times in the history of Israel was this command ever actually followed. We actually see references to that in the judges as as Israel goes into exile mm-hmm. and comes out of exile. It, part of the reason is because they did not were not faithful to obey all that the Lord had commanded them that day. Yeah. Yeah. They did abuse the poor. So all of this is because God cares about the poor, because God wants to point us to a greater future, a greater day when Jesus Christ is going to set a right all wrongs. And in this way, I think there is an element of debt forgiveness that when viewed through a biblical lens, really strikingly points us to Christ. Mm. And and we're going to talk about ways in which it's consistent and inconsistent, ways in which it, it, it really meets this pattern in some ways that it doesn't. But in general, the whole idea of forgiving debts has biblical merit. Yeah. The next verse we wanted to look at is Psalm 37, 21. We have shared this many times here on the podcast, and it is the wicked borrow and do not not repay. repay. So it's important to note that this is neither a command or it is a proverb. It's just a simple observation observation. by David. And I think that's very important. And the implication here is that those that are upright will fulfill their obligation on any and all debt that they incur. What do you you have to think about that and say about that, Tim? So, okay, how does this relate to forgiveness of a debt? Yeah. Uh, So the idea here is that it is a one's shirking of their obligations. Correct. Born out of a heart that is miserly, mm. stingy, or or focused on their own money and self fulfillment. Wicked. Is wickedness. And and it is it is that heart that causes them to not repay. It is not the heart that says, I'm gonna pay back the bet the, the debt, but we've come to an arrangement. We're now seeing that debt forgiven. Right. That's not from a wicked, evil heart necessarily, Correct. not necessarily. Right. So that, that's where, yes, it's it's true. I think it has absolute bearing on this conversation. But as long as we're our heart level is not about 
taking advantage of others. Yeah. This is this is fine. To continue this thought about is this loan forgiveness biblical, Philemon 118, Paul states, if he has wronged you in any way or owes you anything, charge that to my account. <laughs> So in this case, Paul was wanting and willing to take on the debt of Onesimus Mm -hmm. for it is to be charged to Paul's account. It was like Paul handing his credit card, whatever you need, put put it all on my card here. And this is a real forgiveness of debt. One person taking the debt of another off of their shoulder, eliminating them from their responsibility and transferring it. Now, in this situation, to Paul himself, he's saying, yeah, yeah. I'm taking that debt. So clearly we, we could take time. There's a lot of other verses and passages that we could look at. I mean, there, there are obviously all the passages that talks about the debt that we owe Jesus bore. Jesus right. took our debt of sin to the cross. Jesus died for our sins. Jesus covered and paid all of that. He paid the penalty for our sins. The cost of every sin was like a balance building up in the account against us, and God settled it all. He poured all of that wrath upon Jesus. We did not have to bear a single ounce of God's wrath. Yeah, It was all poured on Jesus. Amen. That is debt forgiveness. So Amen. yes, in a sense, debt forgiveness has biblical merit. It's not. It's also, I, I want to be careful not to overstress the point here. But I guess what I'm trying to say is, like, I don't want to. I don't want to make it too point to, to say Joe Biden is being biblical in what he's doing. Right. There are some problems with it. So let's talk. So let's take a look at our second point here, and that what Biden is doing has echoes of the great gospel truth of our sins being forgiven. And that's kind of where you were going, Tim. So clearly we are not stating that Biden and his administration, that they are our financial saviors. Clearly they are not, but what they are proposing to some degree has some parallels to what we just saw in scripture. Mm. So the choosing to release someone from debt, it's very biblical. It's gracious. It's generous. It's seen throughout scripture and it's the right thing to consider to do. You know, we talked about the the little rabbit hole I did about usury. Part of the whole point with the the idea of usury was that it was forbidden to charge interest on loans to the poor. Yeah. Why? Because we're to look out for the poor who are struggling to yes. make an ends meet. And unfortunately, sadly, for for maybe sinful reasons for the borrower, but maybe and oftentimes uh, abusive lending practices from institutions and schools pushing students in directions to get loans without any other alternative. We have millions and millions of college graduates or, or maybe people who haven't even graduated struggling with debilitating, crippling amounts of student loans. 43 to 44 million people. Yeah. And they're unable, not all of them, certainly, but certainly there are a significant number of them who are struggling just to be able to get any kind of stability under their feet financially because of their student loan obligations. So in this way, forgiving some of this loan is a is a way of showing grace to those who perhaps don't deserve it, but who nonetheless are given that grace. It's just a, it's a picture of the gospel. Yeah. Yeah. It echoes some of the great gospel truth that, that we see in scripture. But third, we want to see that Biden's, yeah, this forg- is where I was going. Yeah, yeah. Biden's forgiveness falls far short <laughs> of the biblical gospel. This is true. So the student loan forgiveness program is really not in f- the full definition of the word forgiveness. In order, well, not in the biblical definition. Not in the biblical. Yes. In order to truly understand what this program is, we need to bring in another word that would probably and should be included in this. And that additional word is transfer. transfer. Yeah. Because there's a huge difference between being for, between forgiveness and transfer. And in this program, it cannot in reality and function – have just one of these two words. It really needs to have both within the title because that's what is actually going to happen. Mm-hmm. So here's here's the deal. Here's the way this this it falls short. Y- you think a transfer 
or you can think of an even more biblical word, mm-hmm. imputation. Good. I, Tim, I so love that. The, the, what happens in, in biblical terms is that the sins on our account are imputed to Christ. So well said. he takes our filth and our rags, mm-hmm. and it's double imputation. So he, it, our sins are imputed to Christ, but his righteousness is then imputed on us. Amen. We are clothed in his righteousness, in his beautiful, pure robes of white. Amen. So our sins are no more ours. They are Christ's. They are born on the cross. Mm-hmm. What's happening here with the Biden forgiveness plan is that Joe Biden is not taking your debts on himself. No, he is not saying here, I'll give you all of my wealth and you can take all of, or, and I will take all of your debts. That's what Jesus did. Joe Biden's not doing that. And he, he obviously he's not trying to do that. He's not saying he's doing that. It's not the same thing as the gospel presentation. In fact, what, Joe Biden is doing is he's taking your debts and rather than bearing them himself, he's quote unquote forgiving that debt. But in essence, that money's already been spent. Correct. It's already gone out of the federal budget. It's gone to the schools to pay the, to pay the tuition or whatever else has happened. Now, every other taxpayer in the nation must continue to pay off the debt that you and I or students have incurred. Right. You see how different that is than the gospel picture. Yes. It, in a sense, it has echoes of the gospel. In another sense, it's like, yeah, it kind of falls a little short because it rather than, than bearing it himself, it's being transferred to the rest of the nation. Yeah. And that's why I said in the beginning of this sec- this segment here, I think it's important. Yes, it is student loan forgiveness, but to have that word forgiveness without the word transfer there needs to actually be, they need to go hand in hand yeah, because that's yeah. exactly what has taken place here. And this is the reason why many, many, many Christian people who are conscientious are feel conflicted about accepting the student loan forgiveness. Should I accept it or not? Because it's not true forgiveness. I'm, I am transferring my obligation to the rest of the taxpayers. And is that, is that ethically, is that morally acceptable to do? Yeah. Boy, that is a sticky wicket. We're and gonna try we're, to we're, we're gonna, gonna try to dive into that. Yeah, but we're, that's kind of the the issue that we're trying to raise here. So we wanted to bring in this this topic and to process this idea of forgiveness and transfer. And as we do this, I, w- I want to bring in this passage of scripture. I think is going to kind of bring some good clarity when it comes to this transfer and forgiveness aspect. Isaiah 53, 5, but he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. So we see here, Jesus did not take our debt and disperse it to others. This passage says it was upon him. I'll use a different phrase. The buck, the payment stopped with him. That is such a great passage. Thank you for bringing that up. I, it, it so spoke to me when I read that the other day. So good. I think it, it all came upon Jesus. We have to, have to, have to like pay attention to that passage, but also pay attention to this next verse. Colossians 2, 13 through 14, it says this, and you who were dead in your trespasses and in the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him. Pay attention to this. Having forgiven us all our trespasses by how? By canceling the record of debts mm. that stood against us with its legal demands. This he set aside, nailing it to the cross. Wow. Isn't that powerful? I'm telling you great passage of scripture. This was a transfer of our sin debt from us to the cross Mm -hmm. where Christ took it upon himself to offer us forgiveness, real true forgiveness and eternal life with him forevermore. Yeah. This is the passage I was thinking about earlier when we were talking about how there are so many other passages that are so powerful here with debt forgiveness, what Jesus did. And this is the ultimate passage I see of forgiveness Mm. that we have. He canceled the record of our debt, a debt 
that was so huge, so big, there is no way in our entire lifetime or many lifetimes could we ever pay that debt back. Yeah. But it says right here that he nailed it to the cross. He took it upon himself and yep. he nailed it to the cross. Yep. So as we were putting this session together. So let's get down to brass tacks here. There were some very clear and obvious questions that came to our minds and along some came to us yeah. from other people. And we kind of like summarize them into our yeah. top three. So let's take a quick look at these top three questions about student loan forgiveness. So number one, should a Christian, should a biblical steward accept student loan forgiveness? That is a great question, and I have been asked that one, and it sounds like you have Multiple also. Times. Yes. Well, I, I took a look at the Word of God, and I I came up with a passage to kind of process this through. Second Timothy chapter 1, verse 3, it says, I thank God, whom I serve with a clear conscience, the way, the way my fathers did, as I constantly remember you in my prayers night and day. Now, for some, this debt forgiveness is applied once and you submit the paperwork, it's been forgiven, it's not necessarily uh, required for you to take it. If your conscience binds you from accepting it, obey what's going on within. Mm -hmm. You need to have this, I like what Paul says here to Timothy, this clear conscience, because for many it is offered you're not obligated to participate. Yeah. So it's it's one of those things where you and God need to get together and process this. All right, l let me just break it down here. If before the Lord, you're praying about this student loan forgiveness, you, do I take it, do I not take it? First of all, I want you to know you're free to take the forgiveness if you have no conscientious objection otherwise. So well if, if your conscience is not bound, so let, let, let's say you're on a Twitter debate with someone and saying, no, this forgiveness is a form of theft and blah, 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 blah. You never take it. Well, you would be a hypocrite if you took the debt. Well, forgiveness. Said. Yep. If, however, you, you know, you're struggling, you're, you're trying to get your feet under, you want to be a good steward. You're trying to make headway but you just can't seem to make progress with these student loan forgiveness, it would be a fantastic stewardship opportunity for you to be able to legally and ethically just accept the, the forgiveness that's coming to you from the government and get yourself, take this opportunity to get yourself in a better financial position. I think that's the key that I want to focus on. Does that make sense? It does make sense. And I just wanted to look up here. Um, in Romans 13, we have this next question that kind of comes into play here. And what about this pay to each all that is owed? How does this fit in as we see in Romans 13? It says, hey, you need to pay your debts. Yeah. So, Tim, that sounds good, right? You know, you can accept it as long as your conscience is bound. But doesn't the Bible bind your conscience? Because it says pay to all what is owed. And well, it's the, pretty clear. Yeah, pay it. Yeah. Okay. Well. The answer is, if you owe it, you should pay it. Mm -hmm. But if it's no longer owed because of forgiveness or whatever reason, uh, you don't have you don't have an obligation to repay. So I'll give you an example. I was talking to one student loan borrower recently who told me that uh, he got a Parent PLUS loan. His father took out a Parent PLUS loan for him, uh, and it was, it was sizable enough. His dad then had his foot amputated. Oh my. For a number a number of reasons. Well, he went ahead and applied for um a disability clause that allowed for forgiveness of st certain student loans should there be some kind of a disability and because he is the father taking the parent plus loan had a disability, a amputated foot, his entire loan was forgiven. Wow. <laughs> I don't think he has any moral obligation to pay that back. It was it was right. forgiven. Right. It was legitimate reasons, it, it, legitimate cause. It was written into the contract. Mm -hmm. It was you know something that was a, available to all all people, not just him. Right. If you have a disability, you can have this. You can apply for this. He did, and I think that was great. If you have forgiveness of a loan, I don't. You no longer have that obligation to repay. So if you have the obligation, you must pay. But if you don't. 
it's not required. And I think that is well said. What about this next question? How does let your yes be yes fit in with making a debt commitment and paying it back someday? You've made a commitment. You say, I'm going to take upon this debt for, we'll say, in this case, student loans. Mm -hmm. I'm going to uh, assume that debt. But in that assuming of the debt, I am making a commitment that I am going to pay that back. Mm -hmm. Talk about that for a moment. Let's, you know, it has some similar connections to the previous one. Yeah. I mean, I kind of view it as the same way. Um, yeah. Your yes needs to be yes. Your word needs to stand. You need to be um, true to your word. If you owe it, you pay it. Right. So the question is, do you owe it? The government says, and the lender who's serving your loan says, no, you no longer owe it. So are you violating your word and pay back something or to not pay back something that is not recognized as a, as in debt? I, I would say no, probably not. I, and I would agree. I think the only gray area, which I have talked with, I think two different individuals about, and that gray area is what we talked about earlier in that transfer of our debt to somebody else. Yeah. Outside of Christ, I don't want my debt transferred to anybody else. I hear you. I hear you. But here's the thing. It, it's not being transferred to a person. It's being transferred to a people. Well said. And, and what that means is that it's, it, I mean, it's a, add insult to injury, right? All of us as taxpayers are paying for, for you know, welfare, Mm -hmm. you know, good or bad, whether you love it or hate it, right? It's, it's a thing we're, we're doing right. that. We're, we're paying for social services. Correct. We're paying for all, all of these other elements. And there are elements of those programs, which are fundamentally at least motivated from the right place. Agreed. Some of it, not, I'm not going to say all of it, but some of it is like the, the Bible says Israel was supposed to care for the poor, was yeah. supposed to look out for them. Now the government is taking over that responsibility. The, the, the nation of Israel is obviously not doing that. We're, we're, near, we're in America. We're not in Israel. Right? right. Right. So the church isn't taking that responsibility. It's the government that's doing it. So yeah, I think to a certain extent, Taxes are fine to go to pay for those things. And this is what we're talking about. Taxes are going to go up. Right. But taxes and the taxing authority is an authority that the government has, whether you like it or not. Mm -hmm. So, again, I don't think it's a violation of that. M may I, may I, before we close, give a couple applications to you as a borrower if you take student loan? So, if, if I end up accepting student loan forgiveness... What should I do next? This is assuming that the loan is already forgiven. You now have either more income in your paycheck or, you know, you have more disposable income because your, your, your debt payments are, have gone down. What do you do with that money? For, for many student loan borrowers, my suggestion would be this. The first thing you do, if your payments go down because you paid off a loan or two, before you allocate all of those extra funds towards the next debt, I would do this. First of all, I would take those funds and make sure you have an actual functional emergency fund. Yeah. So Critical. get yourself a thousand dollar starter fund or, or a three month emergency fund so that you're able to avoid future debt. Yes. An emergency fund is not an optional thing for the good steward. He must have reserves. We must live on less than we earn. The second thing we do is look to pay down some of the credit card debt that you may be carrying. We need to get rid of that because th you must live on less than you earn. Correct. You, it bar, you put money on a credit card, it has to be paid off every single month. It has to become a discipline. So if you have some of that you're carrying, knock it off. No, not, not, I'm, not, I'm sorry, I'm not saying knock it off, you bad person. I'm saying knock it out. Yes. Knock out that debt. And then once you've got your emergency fund, you've knocked out some of the, the, the problematic debt that you may be carrying, the consumer debt. allocate every other available budgetary dollar towards killing your student loans. Yeah. And your goal must be to get rid of these student loans as quickly as you can. We're going to talk about 
student loans and how to get rid of them, how to deal with them next week. But that's a little bit of a of a taste or a teaser to help you thinking about student loan forgiveness. And now what do I do? Let's work on building this reserves, paying off some consumer debt, then allocating towards other student loans. Well said, Tim. So as we close this out, it wasn't the easiest of topics today, yet one that people are looking for information and some answers, and they got a lot of questions. And believers are looking for some solid biblical responses to this. So we are not wanting to tell you what to do or how to think, or we just wanted to give you what we know about this program, what we see it through a financial and stewardship lens, and more importantly, what does the Word of God have to say, and what are some transferable principles from the Word of God that we can bring into this topic? Even in our office here, we have different views. We we see the, we see this student loan forgiveness on many different levels. And we're some are very glad to see that something's finally happening and others are not happy campers with how this transfer of debt is happening. So we're on all over the map on things here. This the score is not settled yet. There's still much discussion and legal actions and things are going to take place. We're sure that things are going to change, but as of right now, hang tight, pray, because nothing is set in stone right now. And remember, we do not trust in chariots and horses or governments or debt release, but we trust in the name of the Lord, our God. We want to thank you for joining us on this episode of the Stewardology Podcast. Now, don't forget, send us your questions, your comments, your thoughts. How do you do that? Go to stewardologypodcast.com forward slash idea and take advantage of our free personal stewardship reviews so that you can take your next step to become an even better steward of all that God has put into your care. How do you do that? You go to stewardologypodcast.com forward slash review. Consider giving us a review where you listen to. I was talking to somebody uh, a week or two ago. And they were going to jump on there and they're going to give us a review because they've really enjoyed, they stumbled upon the podcast, enjoyed it. And they're like, Hey, how can I help you reviews? Reviews are that, that's the big thing that you can do to help us yes. and visit our website, stewardologypodcast.com for some helpful financial resources, stewardship resources. And we have over a hundred episodes there, Tim. So what an exciting thing. Episode 106. All right. Until next episode, take care. God bless and praise God who has forgiven all of our trespasses by canceling the record of debt and nailing it to the cross. Thank you for joining us on the Stewardology Podcast, where financial stewardship and theology meet. We'd like to help you take your next steps in biblical financial stewardship. First, subscribe in your podcast provider to get the newest episode delivered to you every week. Next, follow us on social media and visit our website at stewardologypodcast.com. There you can find our social media links and our entire episode archive. Remember, some trust in chariots and some trust in horses, but we trust in the name of the Lord our God. See you next week on the Stewardology Podcast. Securities and advisory services offered through Genius Wealth Management, member FINRA and SIPC.